You know, for many people, fame comes from extraordinary moments. For David Sedaris, well, he's become famous for the ordinary ones. Things like growing up as part of an unusual family in the suburbs of Raleigh, North Carolina, working as a Christmas elf in a department store, or attempting to learn a new language. David has a gift for finding humor in the mundane, a gift brought to bear in a string of bestsellers that, while funny, often underpinned by darkness. David, whose sister is the writer and comedian Amy Sedaris. Hey, well, maybe Saturday we can go to uh, Mini Strokes and play some pop pie. Got his big break on the radio as a contributor to the excellent NPR program, This American Life. Well, am I right, Glass? Coming up in this hour, Act One, writer David Sedaris. His latest collection of stories is called Let's Explore Diabetes with Owls. Let's what? Diabetes with Owls? Weirdly, this book doesn't teach you how to explore diabetes with owls, but it may make you laugh while tapping into some of your true emotions. David Sedaris! Hello, Hello. 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 Welcome to the show. Did you, uh, did you celebrate Greek Easter? I, I did. I, I did it the way I usually do, which you get a couple of notifications on uh, Facebook. You say to your other Greek friends, I call him and we wish him happy Easter. That's it. Did uh, you celebrate? Uh, no. I don't remember where I was. But did you used to do that, that game where you tap the blood red eggs together? Yeah, and then one kid, yeah. person says, Christos and Estes, yeah. right? Christ is risen. And yeah. what's the other person say? Christ is risen, Christ is dead. Isn't it first dead, then risen? I, th I, I thought, you s I would say, Christ is risen. Yeah. And then you say in Greek, indeed he has risen. <laughs> and that's what, that always seemed like the worst dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to have written it, how would you have written it? I would say to you, Christ is risen. When? Or where is he? Instead of... <laughs> What's he wearing? Instead of, uh, indeed, he has risen. <laughs> when you, um, the older you get, the, the more connected do you, are, are you to some of that stuff from your childhood, those sorts of traditions? Mm, no, I mean, I'm not a... We, went, we were allowed to make up our mind at 16 whether we wanted to continue going to church or not. When you were a kid, did you connect for another reason? Connected to impress your father, to find a way to relate to your dad in some way? Well, like the swim team, my, I was on the swim team, and then there was a kid on my, the star of our swim team uh, was named Greg. And then all my dad ever did was talk about Greg. Boy, that Greg. Did you see him? He's a real winner. He should be in the Olympics. And, you know, when you're like 11 years old, you're like, okay, enough about Greg already. And he just talked about him, and my, it's like he had a crush on him. Like, my dad had a boy crush on Greg, and it... <laughs> but all my life, my dad would do that. Like, he'd pick a boy my age and just, and just talk about him and talk about what a great guy he was, and it just would make me uh, just crazy with jealousy. At some point, did you feel that you were missing validation, you wanted validation, you were getting validation? Uh... Well, I mean, you never... You know, so now I write, and like I said to my dad, my last book came out, and I said, you know, my book's number one on the, on the New York Times bestseller list. He said, well, it's not number one on the Wall Street Journal list. <laughs> and, and I said, well, you know, that's not really the list that book people turn to. <laughs> but you have to, you know, there's no way I'll ever get what it was that I... He's not a book person, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't understand writing. And, and, and I'd rather, I think it'd be worse to have a parent who did understand what it is that you do, you know? How so? I'm like when I meet someone who's a doctor and I say, is your dad a doctor? And if they say yes, I feel sorry for them. Because <laughs> you don't want your father saying, I did better than that on my MCAT. Isn't that what it's called? Like the test that you take. And I think you should just have a doctor who's like, I can't believe that you can even pick an appendix out. Like when you open somebody out, that you even know which of those things the appendix is. I think it'd be better to have a parent like that who right. just doesn't understand and, and just is in awe of what it is that you do. I don't have the awe part, but I have the not <laughs> understanding part. But if you have one parent who's like into you, that seems good enough to me. You know what I mean? I mean, two seems kind of excessive. It really does. <laughs> Amy was on the show. Let's play a clip here. I just think coming from a large family and just uh, us sitting around trying to be really funny and trying to, you know, uh, be, our timing came from that. You know what I mean? Sure. You know, if you're sitting on the dinner table, you wanted to get in there with a joke or whatever. That's probably where it started. Same story for you. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know people who have an only child. Or the child will be talking and he'll say, and then um, the teacher um, asked Brian um, about uh, Mexico. And Brian said, what's Mexico? And the teacher said, you didn't read the chapter. And he said, and my mother would have been like, are you crazy? Like, I'm not listening to this crap. Like, <laughs> pick it up a little. So, because there were so many of us, you had to just, you did, you had to get right in there. And if someone's paused between a story, you think, oh, I got a better one, Poof. And you move right in there. I'm sticking around more with David after this. All right, coming up, he's an openly gay man, but David Sedaris, satirist, has a bit of an issue with gay marriage. We'll find out what that is next. The cows look forward to anything. They must be so bored. I mean, what do they even do all day? Do they regret things? Like, I should have gone to that side of the field today because this side is a mess. Hi, how are you? James Canaris is here. Tell us about that clip. Oh, I met a fellow a couple of years ago, a young man named Kyle Alvarez, who made a movie called Easier with Practice, and he sent it to me. And, gosh, I bet Kyle was maybe 25 when he made that movie, and he wanted permission to make a movie out of a story I wrote called COG. And it debuted at Sundance, and I went, and I saw it. And... I, I, I wasn't prepared for how strange that is for someone to say, David, and then to have someone who is on Glee turn around and say, yeah? <laughs> someone on Glee. Um, <laughs> and so it was, it, it was so startling to, I, it was so startling to, it, I, I, it just really crazy to see someone be you in a movie. How many places do you rent out now? We have, my parents were land, my parents were slumlords, right? And like one, one time my parents got sued because the bathroom ceiling fell in on somebody and then his wife showed up at court in a neck brace. It was like, and they got sued. Um, I have, I, I have, we have three different tenants. I, I have to say like as a gay person, I never felt as a gay man, you know, as much as you might be discriminated against in other ways, in housing, you always go, because that's the number one rule for landlords, rent to the gay man. That's because they're going to say, all they're going to do is make improvements. And all they're going to do is, is once they're finished with the inside of the house, they're going to move outside and they're going to put in shrubs and stuff. So that is, that's who you, even the most ardent homophobe, <laughs> if given the choice between two 19-year-old co-eds in a mincing, prancing homosexual with a purse over his arm, they will rent to the homosexual with a purse over his with arm. With or without a Pomeranian. <laughs> with or without, even if there's no dogs. <laughs> and, and the mincing homosexual wants to bring his Pomeranian, they'll rent, they'll say, okay, we'll make an exception in your case. <laughs> You, I'm sure, growing up experienced, did you experience um, that kind of uh, stuff you're talking about? Uh, you know, I got to say, I mean... That sounds like a tough dude, the way you describe him. Yeah, but I'm, I'm of an age, though, when, you know, at, at that, like in the 60s in North Carolina, like, I, there were no books with gay people in them. You know, there were certainly no movies or TV shows, so it was easy to believe that you were the only one on Earth, and I, I mean, so that's amazing to me. Is that now? I mean, I don't care what little town you live in. You you know that certainly you might be the only gay person on your street, you know, or in your town. But at least you know there are other ones out there. And so it's amazing to me that in my lifetime, you know, it's gotten to the point where where gay people can marry each other. You know, in some places, and it's just a matter of time. It'll be everywhere. But that's a huge change in my lifetime, Great. huge. Even in the last five years, how rapid the change is mm -hmm. happening. Yeah, it is. And it's interesting. See, I wish that gay marriage would be legal everywhere, but that no gay people would act on it. 
Because look, nobody wants to go to anybody's wedding. It's just true. It's just, it's just true. Nobody wants to get on a plane and go halfway across the country and wear clothes that they don't feel comfortable in and choose between the beef and the chicken and to sit in a loud room where it's, this horrible band is playing way too loud and they're getting their picture taken. Nobody wants that. So I wish that gay people would fight for the right to marry and that not one of them would ever, <laughs> ever do it. Well, my friends, there it is. Let's explore diabetes with owls. David Sedaris, we'll be right back.